Well, good morning. I'm so glad you joined us for our study in the Book of Romans. My name is John Raymer. I'm the pastor of Grace Point Church. You can find all my past teaching right here on this website. Uh, I teach right through Bible books, and that's all free uh, for you to enjoy. Well, this morning we're going to continue our study in the Book of Romans. This is our third sermon on that. We teach through Bible books from beginning to end because that's the way they were written. Uh, skipping around doesn't help you understand. Uh, Romans is about, essentially, how to be right with God and what that looks like and how we live. So this section, uh, verses 16 and 17, a uh, pithy section, we're going to look at that today, is about the only way to be right with God. Now, Romans was written uh, by Paul, and he was passionate. And you can tell when someone is passionate about something, can't you, by the way they spend their time, uh, their energy, uh, their money, what they buy, I live in Chicago, and we have passionate Bear fans who spend a lot of time and energy and money on supporting the Bears, watching the Bears, uh, getting Bears tattoos, getting tickets, uh, decorating their car, buying tickets to the games, souvenirs, hats. And every year, Bears fans think next year will be better. Every year, they believe in their passion that we're going to beat Green Bay twice, we're going to beat Minnesota twice, and we're going to roll through the playoffs and have a great victory in the Super Bowl. And every year, we are disappointed. It is fun to be a fan and passionate about something, but it's disappointing when what you're passionate about doesn't actually meet your expectation. Now, Paul was incredibly passionate about the gospel. He spent time, energy, money, his life on proclaiming the gospel because the gospel had changed his life and he knew it was God's message to the world. I mean, it's great to have sports victories. I'm a Michigan fan, and I enjoy it whenever Michigan does happen to win. But there's nothing like eternal victory. What about a victory that God brings that brings transformation of despairing persons to hope, brings joy, brings meaning, brings connection to God, and brings eternal life? Well, that's what the gospel is that we're going to look at this morning. It's God's plan uh, to bring sinners into right relationship uh, with himself through Jesus Christ. We saw before that Paul was a bloody persecutor of Christians. As a passionate Jew, he thought Jesus was a phony. And then he encountered the living Jesus and immediately flipped, literally within a few days, and became a proclaimer of Jesus Christ. He spent 25 years being an apostle and a proclaimer when he wrote the letter to Romans. Thirteen books in the New Testament are written by him, and almost all of them are either to people or to churches that he had planted. Romans is the only church that he had not yet visited. It's his longest letter, and we might say it is the most important letter. Romans has a beginning, long beginning, which we looked at the last two weeks, a long conclusion, and in the middle, four major sections like a symphony. I used that analogy before. Each section builds upon the previous one about the gospel of grace. How we're saved, how we're transformed, how God sovereignly is working grace, and then what grace looks like in the life of the church. That's the walkthrough of Romans. And like all authors, it's important to understand why did someone write something? Because when we know when an author wrote something, why they wrote it, what they meant, what their intent was, then the details make sense. And that is especially important with Romans, because it has that long introduction and conclusion and four major sections. If we understand the overarching purpose of why Paul wrote this, then each of the pieces you will understand, oh, that goes here, that goes here, this relates to that because we know what he did. So this is Paul's purpose for writing the book of Romans that I've come to in my studies of it. For God to be glorified by a united missionary church, which has been transformed by faith in the grace of God. Uh, that's the big thing. Now this morning, our text is small. It's only two verses, and they are thick. They are jam-packed with meaning. Uh, one word often refers to many things that come later in the letter. It's a propositional statement, a thesis statement, the major statement, and it especially informs uh, the next major section from chapter 118 through the end of chapter 4. 
and it summarizes the most important concept that any human being can get a hold of, and that is this, how to be right with God. So let's look at these verses, 16 and 17. 16 is the proclamation of the gospel, and then 17 is the principle of the gospel. This is 16, this is 17. I'll read them. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, or faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. We see here that Paul is passionate about the gospel, and he explains, in essence, what the gospel is. He starts very emphatically and says, I am not ashamed of the gospel for or because, that Greek word is a causal word, probably better translated because, because it is the power of God for salvation. We've already talked about passion, and he was more passionate about the gospel than any sports fan ever has been or rock groupie. If we look back at 14 and 15, which we looked at last week, he uses two verbs and then this verb, ashamed, to describe his passion for the gospel. In verse 14, he says, I am bound, I am under obligation. In verse 15, he says, I am eager. And two very positive words. And now he uses a double negative, I am not ashamed. A double negative is a way of saying a positive in an affirming way, in a strong way. Uh, we could easily and perhaps should translate, I am super proud of the gospel. He's committed to it. He's eager for it. He's super proud of it. But he used that word shame for a reason. Why is that? Well, when we think of shame today, we think of shame emotionally. I'm ashamed of who I am. I'm ashamed of what I've done. I'm ashamed of what's been done to me. That is what's called a subjective sense of shame. It is a feeling, an internal feeling. But Paul's using shame in a different way. He's using it in the objective sense of the word to not be publicly disgraced or to be wrong in what he's saying. What he's saying is this, is that uh, I'm bound to it, I'm eager for it, and I'm proclaiming it because I am confident that when I stand before God at the end, I will be found to have been honorable in what I said, I will in no way be ashamed, and I will be vindicated for what I have said. He's emphatically confident in the power of the gospel, but humble in himself. He describes how he came to the Corinthian church. He says he came to them in weakness and fear and trembling. Uh, he was not a proud man, but he was proud of the gospel. So why the word shame? Well, Rome was, the Roman culture, is a, was a shame-honor-based culture as is today true for the Middle East and almost all, all Eastern countries. In fact, most people in the world operate under a shame-honor system. In the West, where we are, we operate under a guilt-right-wrong system. For them, it's not right-wrong as much as it is shame and honor. Rome was the pride, the honor of the Roman Empire. Spectacular buildings. You can see the ruins today. I've been there several times. It's an amazing place. And every Roman citizen in their lifetime wanted to go visit Rome. And it was the top of the list as a tourist, but not nearly as a tourist, but to be awed by the power of Rome. And Rome was all about power and shame. You were honored by power. Power was everything, whether it was military conquest or personal, con uh, personal power through relationships through the acquisition of slaves or more wives or more money. To not have power is to be shamed in a shame-based culture, to not be honored. And so Rome as king of power and king of honor to lack power to the Romans was ridiculous. It was shameful, dishonorable. And so they endured all things. Uh, most of them were what are called Stoics. They endured all hardship without any complaint. Uh, we call it the British stiff upper lip, which the British used to be known for, not so much anymore. So the idea to the Romans that a crucified Jew 
from a backwater town could be the power and honor of God to them was ridiculous because there was nothing more dishonorably, dishonorable in the Roman Empire than to be crucified. Uh, they took crucifixion from the Assyrians and perfected it and made it what it was to, to them as a form of dishonor, a form of shame, and a form of capital punishment. Capital means head. When someone has their head cut off, we use that term. They were decapitated. Capital is the top. But a Roman citizen was never crucified. Paul was a Roman citizen, and at the end he was killed in Rome by being beheaded. Peter was a Jew, also not a Roman citizen. He was crucified because he was not a Roman citizen. So it was absolutely absurd to the Romans initially, to all Romans, when they would hear that the king of kings would be crucified naked on a Roman cross. It made no sense to them whatsoever. Paul also talks in Corinthians. He says, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and a folly to the Gentiles. Gentile meaning the Roman world, everyone who wasn't a Jew. Now, why was it a stumbling block to the Jews? Because Jesus was crucified on a tree. He was executed on a tree. And in the Old Testament law, it says very clearly, anyone who was hung on a tree, killed on a tree, was crucified cursed of God. Now we'll see later an explanation for why Jesus was cursed of God in Romans. But again, to the Jews on first hearing of it, that was anathema. That was absurd. There's no way the Messiah, the Messiah would come in power. He would not be crucified. So the cross turns those systemic values of the Jews and the Romans upside down, but it also turns our values upside down. The idea that God would sh save in such a shameful way uh, seems absurd. We think of saving and doing the right thing as doing the best thing we can. But far more than that, the power of the cross undermines our own self-righteousness and our confidence. Because most of us believe we're good enough and that we can be good enough and do good enough that God will grade on a curve and accept us. But the power is of the cross is God's statement that we're all separated from God by our sin that only the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ will make us right with God. Romans 3, 21 and 26, when we get to that, we'll see an explanation of that in detail. So he is not ashamed of proclaiming the gospel. So what is the gospel? Well, the gospel is good news. We saw that last week. It's the Roman uh, term, a herald who would go before the emperor, when the emperor had conquered someone or had a son or the new emperor, the herald would run in front of the chariot saying, good news, gospel, gospel, good news, and then make a proclamation about the king. So the good news that Paul is proclaiming is God's good news for humanity of salvation. It is not merely words. It is not a mere concept. It is where the word and power of God comes together. The message of the gospel is what God has done for us on the cross of Christ. It is the very power of God and God's rescue plan. He will go on to prove this in detail in chapter 118 through 320. So what are we saved from? Some of us hear that phrase. You've got to be saved. Saved from what? I'm okay. What the Bible teaches is that man is separated from God by our willful rebellion. God is creator and king of the universe, and by right, we should be submitted to him, honor him, worship him. We'll see next week that the very essence of sin is to not worship God and be thankful. We put ourselves at the center. So the gospel is really about the kingdom of God, the king who is coming uh, to save us. Jesus said this in Mark, Mark chapter 1, 14 and 15. It says, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. Again, that's a very pithy statement. It's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He is the fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. It wasn't a military kingdom. It came with the king, Jesus Christ. To repent means to turn from our willfulness. Believe means to turn towards him in faith. And we'll see in our continued study of Romans 
that the gospel brings escape from God's displeasure, his wrath against our rebellion. Uh, we're rebels with an advocate. God himself, who we rebelled against, is his own advocate to himself through Jesus Christ. Our righteousness is received from Jesus Christ. It is imputed to us and transforms us. The gospel is the instrument that makes us Christians, and it is also the gospel that keeps us as Christians. We don't start with the gospel and go on to something else. That's why Christians should never tire of the gospel, because it is not only how we first believe, it is how we continue to believe and how we are increasingly transformed into the image of Christ. And that's why Paul earlier said, I am eager to preach the gospel to an existing church. It would move them forward in their faith and stir them up in passion for others. So who is this gospel for? Well, he tells us that the gospel is for everyone, Jew and Gentile, who believes. Very simply, believing is not mere intellectual understanding, but believing is a wholehearted response where we contribute nothing to God. We come, Martin Luther said, it's a great image, with empty hands like beggars to receive bread from God. When we believe God, we're receiving, and what is it we're receiving? We're receiving the promises of God. We believe that what God says in his word is true, and that we can base our life upon those promises. The gospel is boundless and boundaried at the same time. It is boundless, and that is for Jew and Greek. Again, those are not racial Greek, but it means Gentile, that is everybody. So he's telling the Jews, not just for you, but it's for everybody else too. It's boundless, but it's boundary in that the gospel is only effective for those who believe. The gospel won't do you any good unless you personally believe. When he says first to the Jew and then to the Gentile or to the Greek, what does he mean? Well, he means two things. First to the Jew refers to the fact of historical redemption. God started making promise in Genesis 3.15 to all humanity, but then he narrowed down to Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob's son Judah, the tribe of Judah is where King David came from, and out of King David came the Messiah. He was first revealing his salvation plan to the Jews, but even in the Old Testament, it says it will be a blessing to the nations, and Isaiah talks about being a light to the nations. But early on, God worked primarily to the Jews, but many did come to faith by coming to Israel or Israel going out and believed in God. It also means uh, Paul's strategic technique was effective. Everywhere he would go in the Roman world, he would first go to where Jews were because Jews had been spread all over the Roman world and had local synagogues, local churches. And he would go in and show them from the Old Testament that Jesus was in fact the Messiah that they had been waiting for. And in every synagogue, there not only were Jews, but there were Gentiles who had converted to Judaism. Uh, they were called God-fearers. And they were sort of second class, uh, but they were included. So he started with people who had a basis of knowledge. And then after working in the synagogues, he would go out in the marketplace. Because back then, every town had philosophers speaking in public squares. Uh, they didn't have TV. They didn't have the internet. That's what you did for fun. You went and listened to someone talk. Uh, the best of orders could speak for six hours straight and earned a lot of money. I don't think we can endure six hours today. So it means his technique, not only historical, God first to the Jews, but then to everyone, because when the angels announced Jesus' birth, he says, good news for all men. And Jesus sends his disciples to all the nations. That's why Christians are concerned to spread the gospel throughout the earth but it also refers to his technique. That's verse 16. Now let's look at verse 17, the principle of the gospel. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteousness, the righteous shall live by faith. Now what is the righteousness of God? That clearly is the key phrase there. It's what's called a genitive construction of two nouns, one noun that modifies another, like John's jacket is a genitive construction. John and the jacket. The jacket belongs to John. So 
righteousness of God. The term righteousness is probably the key term in Romans. It's used 39 times, and it can mean various things by different contexts. This phrase, righteousness of God, is used by Paul eight times in the book of Romans. And as always, as I've taught my church, their key rule to interpretation, just like understanding someone else, is context, context, context. What did they say? Where did they say it? Why did they say it? What preceded it? What followed it? Because words and sentences have meaning in the context. You can't just pull them out of the air. And again, that's why I preach through Bible, beginning to end in books, because I'm preaching in context. It's the best way to understand. So the righteousness of God in Romans means three different things, depending on context. Who God is, his character, what God does, and how God does it. Who God is, that is God as righteous. It is an attribute of his character. For you grammar Greeks, geeks, it's called a genitive of possession. It is the quality of God. God is unlike Greek and Roman gods, which were capricious. He is always true, always just, always glorious, always holy, always loving, always merciful. It is the total uprightness of the character of God. It also means what God does, what God does. His righteousness is a dynamic saving activity for those who believe, for his people. That's a subjective genitive. God is always doing the right thing by keeping his promises to his people for salvation. We see this quite a bit in the Old Testament. I could read scads of verses. I'll just read a few about where God's saving action is called his righteous action. Psalm 98, 2 and 3. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love to the, and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of God. Isaiah 46, 13. I bring near my righteousness. It is not far off, and my salvation will not delay. I will put salvation in Israel for Israel my glory. So you see it there. It's what God does. His saving is his righteous action. Thirdly, it is what how God saves, how God does it. And that's the primary emphasis in the early chapters of Romans. How he makes sinners right with himself. Because by sin, they're separated. When it's talking about how he's done it, it's what's called imputed. That is, he gives us our righteousness from him. Because God is holy, and we cannot be in the presence of God in our unholy state. We can only be in God's presence, now and forever, if we are righteous. So it is a free gift of grace. And that's the primary emphasis of the first section that we'll start next Sunday, chapter 118 through the end of 4, why are we unrighteous? What's our problem? Why has God made us righteous? And how has he done that? In Philippians 3, 9, we see this same concept stated clearly. Paul says, I want to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, meaning my own efforts are never good enough, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So by faith, we appropriate the righteousness, but it comes as a legal declaration, a forensic declaration. It's not merely not guilty. It's that we are not only not guilty, but we are positively righteous. Removes the negative, adds the positive. It's as if you had a $10 million credit card bet. God negatively removes the debt and then positively puts $10 million in your account. He gives you what you do not have. And that's what Martin Luther discovered uh, roughly 500 years ago in his study of the book of Romans. Rome, Martin Luther was a Roman monk, very committed to the Catholic Church. He had a master's, a, a doctorate, and he was a professor. And as he was teaching Romans, he finally had peace with God. Because before that time, Martin Luther practiced the Catholicism of the day, uh, which was 
he had to do lots of religious things, fasting, vigils, even physical beatings, penance, confessions, endless religious activity, but he could never have peace with God. But it was this verse and understanding it in context that made the difference. Let me read from one of his writings. Quote, Though I lived as a monk without reproach, I felt that I was a sinner before God with an extremely disturbed conscience. I could not believe that God was placated by my satisfaction. I did not love, yes, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners and secretly, if not blasphemy, certainly murmuring greatly, I was angry with God. But at last, by the mercy of God, meditating night and day, I gave heed to the context of the words, namely, in the righteousness of God is revealed, as is written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. There I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous lives by a gift of God, namely faith. And this is the meaning of the righteousness of God revealed by the gospel, namely that the passive righteousness which, which merciful God justifies us by faith. And it is written, he who through faith in righteousness shall live. Here I felt that I was altogether born again and entered paradise itself through open gates. Now it's a whole other historical discussion, but Martin didn't want to leave the Catholic Church. He was forced out and excommunicated. What he tried to convince others is this is what scripture said. But Roman Catholics valued the teaching of the church over the authority of the Bible, the magisterium, as they still do today. See, Luther had thought, taught, been taught, and he taught others uh, as a Roman Catholic monk and doctor of the church that he had to make himself righteous to be acceptable by God. But he could never find the peace with God that Romans 5.1 says. It says, for now we have peace with God. But he never had that inner peace. He would sometimes spend hours every day in the confession booth confessing every minor sin he could think of, but it brought him no peace. He finally saw that the righteousness of God, which is initially a judgment against us, but once we put our faith in Christ, we are given the righteousness of Christ and therefore have peace. So we can say it this way. The righteousness of God is his saving action whereby God brings people into right relationship with himself by the gift of justification which is received by faith. Let me say it in a different way. All religions are about what you do, no matter what form. And sadly, some forms of Christianity subscribe to this. That is, I need to do certain things and what I do is what will make me right with God. But every religion doesn't bring peace. That's why they become even more fervent or despairing in their practices. Because the truth of the matter is, no matter what you do to try to make yourself right with God, it's never enough. It's never good enough. You will never be accepted on that basis. Because everything you have done is sinful to begin with. You'll never climb that mountain. Many unbiblical forms of Christianity espouse and focus on this doing. A church I used to be in long before I was a pastor. When I struggled with my own sin and, and talked to the pastor, his answer was, well, just love Jesus more by trying harder. He didn't tell me about the grace of God. He didn't tell me that I could be justified by faith, made righteous by faith on what Christ had done for me. And see, that's biblical Christianity. It's not what you do, it's what's done for you. Christ has died as the atoning sacrifice, and in that sacrifice, your sins are forgiven, as I mentioned before, and you are imputed, you are given the gift of the righteousness of God. We'll see that so beautifully taught in the next section in Romans. Do is religion, and that's a treadmill, and it's a heartbreak and it'll never be enough. Done is what God has done for you. Now, how do we find that? Well, it is revealed. It is revealed to us. 
See, religion tells us that we can discover it on our own. We can meditate our way there. We can work our way there. We can intellectualize our way there. But the Bible says that's just not true at all. We would never discover God's grace, God's plan of salvation through Jesus Christ, unless it is told to us by God, revelation from heaven, and that's what uh, God's word is. Uh, that's what the Bible is, God's word to us. He has revealed to us truth about who he is, what he does, and how we can be made right with God. And it's always been there. Uh, some people think the Old Testament is one story, the New Testament is another. It's not true. You go back and read Genesis 3.15. Right at the beginning of man's sin, God promises one day a Redeemer will come. The Old Testament has the gospel in it, but it's hard to see. So let me use an analogy that Augustine, the great uh, church uh, father from 15 centuries ago, said. He said, the Old Testament is like being in a darkened room. Uh, the blinds are shut and there's barely any light. So there's furniture in there, but you can't quite make it out. You can't see how it relates to one another. Through Jesus Christ, the revelation of God, the full revelation, as Jesus said, if you want to see the Father, look at me. The windows are thrown open, the curtains pulled back, and the lights are turned on. All the furniture, suddenly we can see the colors, the shape, the arrangement of the room. And that's why Jesus came as the full revelation of God. The Old Testament are promises made. The New Testament are promises fulfilled and made clear. And as it is revealed, it's not only just the truth of God revealed to us, that as is it's revealed in proclamation, as Paul was doing and as I am doing now, uh, it is also released that way. 1 Thessalonians says, For we know, brothers, loved by God, he's chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and the Holy Spirit with full conviction. You see, it's revealed, and it comes with the power of God. What does Paul mean by from faith for faith? Literally means from faith to faith. Now, there are many options in various translations, but i got to get into the grammar here a little bit, sorry. Wherever in the Greek, where there is a noun, to, noun, noun to, noun, construction, always in ancient literature, it's always referring to the same thing with emphasis, but with movement. So think of it this way in English. We have the expression from shore to shore. It's talking about shores, but there's movement, or strength to strength. It's talking about strength, but there's an implied movement to it. Again, what's the first rule of interpretation? Context. Well, he just talked about first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Faith was first in the Jews and then to Gentiles. And so what Paul means here is faith to faith. That is faith first in the Jews and now faith in the Gentiles. And this is the important thing. Faith is the common denominator. The Jews don't come one way. And we Gentiles come the other way. We all come only one way by faith in the promises of God. Now, finally, let's look at the quotation that Paul uses at the end. The righteous shall live by faith. This is also quoted by Paul in Galatians 3.11 and in Hebrews 10.34 by the author of Hebrews. Context, right? And no New Testament writer ever took a quotation from the Old Testament to make it mean something different from what it made in context. So whenever we see an Old Testament quotation in the New Testament, we need to go back to the Old Testament, wherever that quote was from, and read what was going on so we understand the meaning of it properly in context. What was going on? The prophet Habakkuk uh, was in Israel. He was looking out, seeing all kinds of evil in Israel. Israelites against each other, Jews against Jews. And he cried out to the Lord, God, how long is this going to go on? What are you going to do about this evil? God says, I'm going to do something about it. Habakkuk says, okay, do it. But nothing happened. He was waiting, and he was waiting, and he was waiting. The particulars were, which bothered Habakkuk, God says, I'm going to use the Babylonians to punish my own people, because of their wickedness. The promise was justice would come. 
against wickedness. But Habakkuk didn't see it. And so he had a choice. Was he going to believe that God was going to fulfill his promise or not? You see, that's what faith is. Faith is with empty hands we receive the promise of God. We believe that God is as good as his word. That he's going to do what he says, as he says it, when he says it. Habakkuk believed, and God later punished Israel with the Babylonians, but he also told Habakkuk, don't worry, I'm going to punish them too, which he did. So at that time, Habakkuk had the same possible response that we do. See, there's always two possible responses to God and his word. First, we pridefully think we're self-sufficient. We don't need God's help. We don't need to do things God's well. We don't need to make ourselves right with God. We don't need to obey God, whatever it is, but it's a no to God. That's what sin is. We can cope with God on our own, or we'll, we'll invent a religion that suits us so we'll make ourselves acceptable to God. See, that's not faith, that's works. Or the other possibility, the only other possibility, is genuine faith. To believe that God is as good as his word, that he will fulfill his promises made in Jesus Christ, that the gospel alone makes us right with God. See, the gospel says we are worse than we could imagine and more loved than we could possibly dare dream. Religion, uh, what we do to be right with God. Biblical revelation, what God has done for us. So my friends, I want to ask you this morning, uh, where are you? Do you believe in the promises of God and God's word? Maybe you're a Christian and you've, you've, you've drifted away from that. You've drifted away from the truth of the gospel. Friends, you live each day by the gospel. You don't just start with it. Maybe you've gotten away from reading God's word, carefully searching out his promises, believing them, holding on to them. In this COVID crisis, death around us, with unemployment, with conflicts at home. We need to hold on even more than any other time on God's promises. We need to do it every day, but especially when hard times are hard, like Habakkuk, do we have that choice? Do we respond in faith? And then there's those of you watching who you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You're living life your own way, and you're pretty happy with it. Maybe you're not. Maybe that's why you're listening. But there's only one way forward. And that is to be made right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. I've tried to explain how that is today in these pithy little verses. Keep reading in Romans, and we're going to keep doing the study. And if you'd like to know more about what it means to know and follow Jesus Christ, just uh, go to our website right here, and there's a contact form. Fill it out. Say, I want to know more about Jesus, or I want a free book. I have a free book that I want to give you on behalf of the church about the last week of Jesus Christ what it means, and how to become his follower. So this is how we're right with God. It's what God has done for us. These wonderful verses have been uh, preached for 2,000 years. They're the thesis for what we're going to see in the next four chapters and on through Romans. A righteousness of God is revealed to us, received by faith. Let's pray together. Father, we pray the truth of your word the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you are the coming king, that you are the king and you're going to come again in glory, and that you tell us to repent, to turn away from our rebellion, that we never have to make ourselves right. We don't have to clean up our act because that's impossible. The good news is we can just stop and admit we're wrong and say we believe in you. We believe that not only you forgive us, but that you make us right with you. You give us the credit of Christ's righteousness, that good news and that we can live a life of faith based on all of your promises. So we ask God that you would strengthen our faith to believe what you have taught us in your word. Amen. Well, God bless you. I'm so glad you joined with us this morning. Next week, we're going to look at Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. What's wrong with us? See you next week.